Hello and welcome to Cornerstone Alliance Online Church for August 8th, 2021. My name is Joel and I am the lead pastor. Some of you might be watching this on YouTube and others are watching uh, Sunday morning at 10 a.m. So welcome to uh, wherever you are and whenever you're watching. I want you to know that our building is still closed, even though we're able to open according to government restrictions and we're planning on opening up on Sundays sometime after Labor Day and before Thanksgiving. So we will let you know. We are working behind the scenes right now to get ready uh, for that. So we will let you know in due time when we can meet together in person in our building. Let me open from reading Psalm 84. God has called us together here with your, wherever you're watching or wherever you are, and we respond. And so here is from Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here today. I ask that you would enlighten your word I ask that you would speak to each and every one of us and draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I know a lot of you love singing, and I'm not sure if you still sing when you're watching a video or if you're just kind of singing along in your head, uh, but sometimes a song like that could be even a prayer 
that uh, someone is praying over us or for us. Uh, but obviously singing is a type of worship. But have you ever wondered if sport can also be a kind of worship? This is the last day of the Olympics. I'm sure a lot of us have enjoyed watching uh, highlights and different things of, of different sports. And so just, just uh, for interest's sake, let's watch this next video on what does the Bible say about sport? What does the Bible have to say about sport? Well, let's go back to the beginning, the very beginning. Did God create sport? Well, yes and no. It wasn't God who first kicked a ball between two sticks and called it soccer, or picked up the ball, bounced it, and invented basketball. God did not create the games we play, but he did create people, and he made us to run and jump and kick and catch. He gave us talents, and sport is simply organized play, where we can use those talents God has given us. We've been created by God in His image, and we can recognize our ability to play sport is a gift from God, and use those talents to please Him. How can we please Him? By using those talents for His glory, not our own, and by loving all the different people He has put around us. But what about when sport goes wrong? Like anything in life, we see our sinful rejection of God in sport. Instead of respecting the one who made us, we use our talents for ourselves and we don't reflect God in our relationships. What can be done about this? Well, God sent Jesus Christ to pay for our sin on the cross and restore our relationship with him. In Romans 12 verse 1, Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Because of what God has done, restoring us forever in relationship with Him, whatever we do, we can now give as worship to God. So as we play, we can now offer God our talents, seeing our sport as an opportunity to thank and worship Him. And we can offer God our relationships too, as we share life and the gospel with those around us in sport and play. So, if you love sport and are a follower of Jesus, get out there and play. Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 does talk about worship. It urges us to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And then it says, this is your spiritual act of worship. So that means that sport is also an area of life uh, that can be offered to God as an act of worship. Well, today I want to begin a new series, and I feel that this, over the next four weeks, this is also preparation for us opening our building and having everyone meet together in person. This is kind of like one long sermon. It's going to be a month long. And so each week will feel like maybe that wasn't quite complete, but as you put all four of these next weeks together, I think that it'll be a kind of a complete message. And I want to talk about church and specifically this question, uh, like what's the point? Why? Why do we need church? You know, over the last year and a half or so, uh, we have mostly been meeting online. We did have some times where there were watch parties and some of us came together to the build, into the building uh, to watch the video mostly. There was a little bit of live elements and now we're back to completely online. And so a lot of you have noticed that there are some pros to this and a lot of you have noticed that there are also some negatives uh, to this as well. But this has been an opportunity, I think, that God has given us uh, or that, God, that we can use. It's an opportunity that... that um, God has presented to us for us to kind of step back a little bit and let's reevaluate. What are we doing? Why are we doing this? And what is the purpose of church? And so that's what I have been doing over this last little while. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but sometimes in, in the midst of your busyness, you're not really, you don't have time to, to kind of think about what, why are we doing all of this? And so something might happen or you go on vacation and you realize, hmm, I'm not even sure if I even like my job or why am I even doing this? It's just because we've had that time to think and pray. 
And so that's what has been happening over the last year uh, in, with myself and Pastor Sam and Pastor Jordi and your, your board of elders. And so we've been thinking through this a lot. And so I'd like to open up with this question. What do you think is the point of church? Why, why, why do we do church? And some of you may think, you know, ch church for me, you, you may be thinking, church for me is, is walking, um, in, hiking in um, Birds Hill Park on a Sunday morning or in the winter, you know, cross-country skiing. That's where I meet God in the nature. And so for me, that's church. Or others might be thinking, you know, for me, church is going out with a couple other uh, friends for coffee and talking about our lives together. You know, that for me is church. And other, others of you might be thinking, like, why do we even do, like, I don't even think I need church. What, what is the point of all this? You know, I've, we've been doing this for a long time now. And maybe you think, you know, I'm happy just having church services on YouTube. And this is really what's meeting my needs. And so is this, what is the point? Why are we doing this? And so it's really important for us to get behind this. And so this is called the study of church. We call it ecclesiology in theological language because the word ecclesia, that was the word that Jesus used for church and Paul used that word many times for church. It's a Greek word. And so the study of church, ecclesiology, basically that's what we're doing over the next several weeks. And right at the core, I wanna get right down to the core of it today. And so it, let's, let's just take 45 seconds. And if you're watching on your own, I want you to think about this. If you're watching with your family or, or friends or whoever is in your household, then, then have a short discussion. And the question is going to be up and basically we're asking, what, what is the point of church? Why do we even need church? Or, or have you ever, why does God even need church? Does God need church? So here, just take 45 seconds. Let's have a little discussion and then I'll be right back. Okay, so many of us have been doing church, well, differently. Sunday mornings have become a bit more casual. Living rooms and coffee shops have become sanctuaries. And fellowship has a new, less personal touch. It hasn't been easy. Yet, here we are, gathering, worshiping, learning, being the church. Now more than ever, we're reminded of a simple truth. The church is not a building, it's the body of Christ. It isn't built with brick and mortar, but with faith and hope. In the midst of uncertainty, our calling remains the same, to share the truth of the gospel with a world God loves. Throughout history, the church has prospered in difficult times, and today is no different. We are still the church. We're just doing things a bit differently. So the question I'm asking today is why church? What's the point of church? And I think it may feel like it's a little bit backwards because we're not defining what church is first. That's going to come a little bit later in the next few weeks. And so maybe you feel awkward when you say why church? Because what is church? And many of us think that church is, you know, the Sunday morning experience or what we're doing right now. Maybe for me or for you, this is church. This is an event. It's something that happens. But I want you to understand that this is not church. Others of you might be thinking church is, you know, the institution or the organization or, or the building. And so, you know, why do we need church? But that's not what I'm talking about when we use that word church. And so what has been helpful uh, for us is to been to kind of narrow it down like what what is the the core of church if you can i don't know if this helps but if you think of a jenga 
you know, that game tower and you, as you pull out a block, you're supposed to put it back on top. But let's not put it back on top. We pull out a block and it's still standing. It's still a tower. We pull out another block and it's still a tower. What, what is that thing that when we, we take it away, now all of a sudden church stops being church? So for example, uh, we could ask the question, you know, if, if a church doesn't have a youth group, does it all of a sudden stop being church? Well, I think we would say, no, it's still church. It just doesn't have a youth group. And so in that sense, then youth group isn't essential to church. And of course, there, we, we do have a youth group and we want to continue our, our seeing our youth group thrive. But if the church did not have a youth group, it's still a church. What about a building? If Cornerstone Alliance Church did not have a building, would it all of a sudden cease being church? Well, we know that's not true either. We don't need a building in order to be a church. So we can pull those blocks out and yet we still have a church. But where, where, where do we get down to the very basic block where if this block is removed, now all of a sudden it stops being a church? And so the, the, the reason why, like when we ask the question, why do we need church? Here's the answer. And then I want to talk about it and we'll come back to it at the end. Why church? Because God's presence is the way God works. His being present with his people. And so if we were just take a step back from the idea of church, and let's think about God, first and foremost. Right at the very beginning, God created heaven and earth. He created everything in order to be with people. Right in the very beginning, Genesis chapter 3, we see the Garden of Eden. And, and some have described the garden as if it's like a tabernacle for God to dwell with his people. And then we see that um, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, you know, Adam and Eve did not do exactly what they were supposed to be doing. And then they, they felt shame. And so it says here in Genesis chapter 3 verse, 8, 3, verse 8, And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden but it was always God's purpose to live among his people, live with his people. And then as time goes on, we know that uh, violence enters this world and it gets rougher and rougher. And then, and then Noah's Ark comes and God wants to start all over. And then he chooses um, his people. He chooses Moses to lead them out of Egypt. And so we can see God's always had this desire to be with his people, to be present among them. And so here's something that's very interesting from the Moses story. This is from Exodus chapter 33. Now, do you remember that uh, Moses went up Mount Sinai and he received the Ten Commandments and then he came back down and he was to, to show the people, this is how God wants us to live. But when he did that, he found, he came back down and they'd already started worshiping other gods and they'd build a golden calf. And so um, the Lord said, well, then you know what? I've had enough. And the Lord said, I'm not going to be with you anymore. This is what God, the Lord said, go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you. But just go ahead, go to that land without me. He said, lest I consume you on the way for you are a stiff necked people. And Moses pleaded with God. And if you keep reading Exodus 33, he says, God, for how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? So, in other words, what Moses is saying here, what he was declaring is this. God's people are not his people apart from his presence. God's people are God's people because God dwells among them. Because God is present with them. God is there. You know, early on in our discussions and our, our prayers and conversations about church, we would make a list, similar to what I was just saying before, like, what is church? Is, is youth group important for church? Are, are life groups important for church? What if these were taken away? Would it still be a church? We made this list of all these things and realized that without Jesus, like, it can't be called a church. We can't be God's people without God's presence. And so Moses made that point very clear. So if you, if you remove your presence from us, well, we're not your people anymore. That is what makes God's people, God's people. And so we see this carrying on all throughout scripture, throughout the whole story. We see they had this tabernacle, which was like a tent that they could pack up and move along with them as they were traveling around. 
And it was this where God, this tabernacle where God's presence was fully made known. And then finally they were able to make a temple and a permanent place, this gorgeous place where God's presence, a visible sign, a visible symbol, a physical place where God's presence was made, uh, was fully revealed. And then we also see as we continue through the story that there were times when, when the people turned their back on God and, and he said, I'm removing my presence from you but he would always return again and come back to them. And so the temple was destroyed, the people were taken away, they were, came back, a smaller temple was rebuilt again. And we can see that God has this desire to be with his people. Now, we know that God is everywhere. God is omnipresent. And so God was with the Babylonians, right? He's with the Egyptians, but in a special way, he was with his people. And so when we say that God's presence is what makes the church the church, and we say God's presence is what makes God's people God's people, we're not saying he doesn't exist everywhere else. But there's some way that it is his presence that is made fully manifest. It's kind of like a fuller fullness. Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to bring the verse up next week. where With his people, God's fullness is made more fuller. And so um, this is... A theme, God's dwelling place, God being with us, God's presence with us. This is the essential building block of who we are as God's people, God's presence. Let's just take a moment right now. I'd like to read to you from Psalm 46. This is probably a favorite psalm of many of you. And I want you to to pay attention as I'm reading Psalm 46. Listen for these words, with or in the midst, present, dwelling, these kinds of words and showing how important that theme is of God being with and dwelling and being among his people. So allow me, just just listen as I read Psalm 46 to you. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So Psalm 46 is just one of those places where God's dwelling with his people is very apparent. It is probably one of the most prevalent themes all through scripture, God desiring to be with his people. Now, can you think of of maybe the most significant way that God shows us that he wants to be with us? What, what, What is the one thing that we celebrate as Christians that epitomizes God being with his people. Right, the birth of Jesus Christ. God made 
flesh. God so desired to be among us and with us that he took it upon himself, set aside his divinity, and Jesus came. Jesus, who is fully God, came to be right with us, to live among us. And remember his name, Emmanuel, that's what they called it, means God with us. God so desires to be with his people. And this continues. It's not just in the Old Testament, all the way through the New Testament. John chapter 14, he says, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them, with those people. That desire, God has chosen somehow, for some reason, he's chosen to work in the world through his people, through the people of God, through Israel, and now through the church. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, it says, We are the temple of the living God. Remember how the temple was this massive building that, that housed God's presence. And there were special rules for approaching God. And there were ways that, that this was a visible um, it was reality that, that this, we are God's people because there he is. He lives in the temple. And Jesus came and said, you know, it's not going to be like that anymore. There's going to be a time, time very soon where the temple is destroyed and it's not going to be rebuilt because you can worship me everywhere. And Jesus was talking about this time of the church. And so um, even right to the very end of the scripture, Revelation chapter 21, it says, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. That's what we're looking forward to in the end. And when Jesus said, you know, I, I'm, I'm leaving this world, but I'm sending my spirit to be with you and to be among you. And so the church is God's chosen way to be, to work among the nations, to work among the world, to have his dwelling made completely revealed. So when we ask the church, what's the point? Why, why do we even need church? Why do you need church? And I'm not talking about the building. I'm not talking about the event on Sunday morning. We'll define church um, biblically, scripturally in the next couple of weeks. But why do we need church? What's the point? Because this is the presence of God made known through his people. God, has, God needs the church. He chose the church to work, he, to, to make his, his ways known among the people. And so we need church because that's, that's how God works, through his presence. Now, A.W. Tozer, um, many of you have read some of his books. He says this, God's presence is the central fact of Christianity. Think of that. God's presence is the central fact of Christianity. The heart of the Christian message is that God is waiting for us to push into conscious awareness of his presence. In other words, it, it could be that we're just not aware of his presence. And so this is the, the central heart, the central fact of Christianity, and we need to push into that fact, consciously be aware of God's presence when we are gathered together, when we are meeting with other Christians, when it, it's not just a Sunday morning thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 says, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? And so the church is necessary because it is what God has chosen to make his presence known. And as God's presence is made known, when, when God is there, when, when God is present, like, you don't want to be anywhere else. And maybe you've been to some Sunday morning church services. Maybe you've been to some life groups or some prayer meetings, and you've just felt, you know, God, I don't, I don't think God was there. It didn't really feel that, like God was there. Or just, you know, just, just because people get together for wings on a Friday night or just because there's Christians meeting, meeting together doesn't necessarily mean that that is church. But there are some specific ways that Jesus has taught us. He says, when, when you do these certain things, when you do these practices, I am right there with you. Yes, Jesus, God is everywhere. But his presence is made fully known, fully fuller with among these certain practices. And one of those is the gathering of the church. And so 
that's the main thing I want to start off with. Without God's presence, we're not the church anymore. If Jesus is not there, if the Spirit has left the building, it can't be a church, even if we have a youth group, even if we have a building, even if we're singing songs, it doesn't necessarily mean God is with us. And so there are certain things that we can be doing, practices that are laid out in Scripture to show here is where God's presence is fully known. And we're going to be leaning into those things, and I want to reveal some of those things or show you some of those things in the next couple of weeks. You know, there's a song that sometimes we, we sing at Cornerstone Alliance Church. It's called Holy Spirit. And it goes like this. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. That's what we long for. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. You know this song, don't you? Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Come flood this face, place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone by your presence, Lord. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. In just a moment, we'll sing that song, and I'd like you to, to treat it as a modern-day psalm. As, an, as a declaration of God's presence and our desire to be in the midst of God's presence. So let's just take a moment. Let me pray and then we'll take the offering and we'll sing this song together and I'll come back with something else. Heavenly Father, thank you for your presence. Thank you for your desire to be with us and thank you for making that possible. And Lord, we know you are present everywhere. Open our eyes to see where you are working where you are in our midst every single day of the week. And thank you, Lord, for your generosity, and thank, us, thank you for the opportunity to reflect your generosity in our offerings to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thanks for joining us today. I'd like to send you off with some words from Psalm 139 in just a minute, but just want to remind you, this is just the beginning of a four-week sermon series, and really it's like one part of one message. And so hang on to these thoughts. I know you didn't get all your questions answered, but I hope that by the end of this month, we will all be on the same page as regards to why we need church, how do we do, how do, we do church, and what is this thing called church? So, let me send you off with these words from Psalm 139. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. May God guide you every step of the day, every day of the week, and we'll see you again next Sunday.